All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, hope your Sunday is going well so far. I'm going to start with a little housekeeping stuff. So um, everyone is muted and you can't unmute yourself unless I give you permission to. Um, if you put your um, settings in speaker view mode, so if you go up to the upper right hand corner and do speaker view, it will bring whoever is speaking into like the biggest picture. Um, so that'll be the best viewing experience for you. Um, and then if you have any questions at any point, you can go ahead and put those into the chat. Um, and I will be watching that as we are chatting and bringing up questions when I can. And if I don't get to them, we will answer them at the end. All right. So my name is Christina. I am the marketing and communication specialist with Countryside. Um, if you aren't familiar with what we do at Countryside, um, our mission is to build a thriving local food community by connecting people, food, and land in and beyond Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So we have three big goals. We preserve farmland, we cultivate new farmers, and we expand local food in the community. So farmers markets came into the picture as a way to support farm and food entrepreneurs and provide them with the resources needed to have a viable business. Um, from there, we were able to start doing work with um, food access. So that would be making food accessible to everyone, no matter their income level. Um, and then our newest endeavor since 2018 is our new Farmer Academy, um, where we build career pathways for the next generation of farmers. So today we are joined by Jimmy and Cassandra Myers of Front Nine Farm and also um, Kathleen Madden from 24 Carat Kitchen. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Jimmy and Cassandra. Hi, um, my name is Cassandra and Jimmy is my husband. Uh, we run Front Nine Farm, so we are a vendor at the Countryside Farmers Market. So um, we, uh, we have a farm, we've been doing this for five years. Our main focus in farming is uh, to grow a large diversity of different crops. Um, we're very ecologically minded, so we, we want a large diversity of, of cultivated crops, um, insect populations to come and control pest populations. So it's a very um, ecologically minded endeavor that we're doing. Um, we primarily sell about half the products, over half of what we sell is through our CSA program, um, where people subscribe and they get a weekly bag of diverse um, produce items that are in season. And then um, that lasts 28 weeks. The, we also go to um, several farmers markets throughout the year. And that's primarily how we sell our product. Um, we both do this full time. Um, and we're just every year we're, we're trying to get better at what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we want to thank Countryside for uh, letting us be here and talk to you guys about squash today. We do love talking about squash and uh, thank them for everything they do. Um, you know, putting on farmers markets, allowing us to sell yeah. products and stuff like that. So yeah, thank you guys. Look forward to it. Yeah. All right, Kathleen. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathleen Madden. I am the owner of 24 Carrot Kitchen in Brooksville. And um, we are considered a farm to fork restaurant or farm to mouth. I don't know if there's much farm to table going on on these days with COVID, but um, so we try to support as many local farmers as we can. We go out and get our produce, is, which is how we got hooked in with uh, Countryside and uh, really appreciate the wonderful farmers market and all the folks that they bring in to the market. It's probably one of the nicest farmers markets that I've ever been to. And we bring in local produce. We try to get as much organic as we can. And at the cafe, we have grab and go foods. We do prepared meals. Um, I have a master's in nutrition. So I focus on trying to create meals for people who have dietary restrictions. So our facility is a gluten-free facility for people who have celiac disease. They can come in and eat with their family. I think of it as sort of an agnostic environment. So you can be vegan or you can have meat or you can have celiac disease and everybody can sit at the same table and enjoy their meal. Um, we see what else do we do? Oh, we go to local farmers markets when we can and um, we sell local products here in our store and um, I guess try to 
incorporate as much local as we can um, here. So I guess that's uh, it's a good start. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me uh, today, Christine. Of course. Thank the, I thank the three of you so much for joining us. I'm very excited for this conversation because you each bring something different to the table. Um, and I think that it's going to make for a great discussion. Um, so we did have a few more people join in. So I just want to remind everyone again, if you go up to the right hand corner, um, you can put the, the video in speaker view mode so that whoever is speaking is big on your screen. Okay, so we are just going to jump right into tasting the first two varieties of squash. So I've got mine here. We are going to taste Butterkin and Kaboka. Um, I guess I could tell, them about, tell you about them first and then we can jump into trying them. So we'll start with the Kaboka. Um, this one's also called a Japanese pumpkin. Um, it's a sweet and nutty flavor and it's kind of a cross between a pumpkin and sweet potato and it can be one to eight pounds. So mine is kind of a small one, but yeah. So let's give that one a taste. <laughs> That one's not like super sweet to me. I don't know, it probably depends a little bit on the variety, I'm sure. Um, mine isn't too sweet, but still really good. I'm sure there's a lot of delicious dishes you can make with it. Um, let's start, maybe Kathleen, could you talk about some of the things you would prepare with a kaboka squash? Sure, um, now I believe you can eat the skin, is that? Correct, Jimmy and Cassandra, yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so that's one of the things I love about it. I'm a no waste girl, so <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> it's, it's like a, your own little plate. Um, we stuff them. You can use them, mash them like you'd mash sweet potatoes. Um, you can roast them. They're super easy because you don't have to peel them. Um, you can put them in soups, you can put them in salads. They're very versatile. And I think if somebody's gonna try a squash, that's probably a good one to, to do because it does have a really nice, creamy, smooth flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it was definitely creamy and smooth. Not as sweet as like a butternut squash or a sweet potato, but it was still like had a little bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. I liked it though, very good. Yeah, I think the interesting thing about the kaboka squash, um, so all squash is native to Central America. So it's really, um, it's, um, it was later introduced into the Japanese culture, um, but it's kind of like a really like mellow flavor I find. Um, and the reason it's the thinner skin of the squash, which allows you to eat it, it also makes it a little bit more pest prone so it can have more modeling on the skin. Um, and many squash producers don't spray any insecticides. So you can get the insects that do um, frequent squash plants are hard beetled insects, so they're, they, they're not even very um, susceptible to insecticides anyway. But um, yeah, we really like to use it in more like mellow applications because it's not, it's not as sweet as a butternut. Yeah, it's great in like a, as a, like a chili base. Um, and we love growing squash that you can eat the skin uh, because it's a great source of fiber, but also it's um, easy to prepare. We're always looking for squash that's easy to prepare. Um, so you can just cut it, roast it, eat the whole thing, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. The seeds are edible, too. Yeah. <laughs> are the seeds of all squash edible? Yeah, like pepitas are pumpkin seeds that have been shelled. The outer, you know. Um, so, yeah, all squash yeah. seeds are, yeah. are okay. edible. Yeah, I just never think of roasting any other seeds except for pumpkin seeds. I don't yeah. know. It's just like, but yeah. It's a little labor intensive because you have to get all the pith off of them. But. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Some of the squashes are more conducive because the seeds are bigger and it doesn't take you as long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, then we will move on to the butterkin. So if you've got them cooked up, well, I'll tell you about it first. That's what I did with the other one. So this one is a hybrid between a butternut and a pumpkin. Um, so you can definitely tell that when you look at it. It looks like a pumpkin, but the coloring is just like a butternut. Um, and this is really easily substituted for pumpkin or butternut squash in recipes. 
Um, it's about two to four pounds in size typically, and it's got a sweet buttery texture. Let's see. It's kind of stringy like a spaghetti squash. That, that one is one so real sweet. <laughs> That one is so good. We have, that's been our favorite because it's almost got like a little bit of, I don't know, like um, maybe just a slightly bitterness to it that like balances out the sweetness. And I think it's got a really nice like round flavor. Yeah, absolutely. I love using it in place of pumpkin. We made some really good, like, like really creamy soups out of it that are nice and sweet. Uh, you can make like sweet stuff too, like pumpkin rolls out of it or pies, uh, which would be really good. And, uh, yeah, just a different kind of flavor. Everybody's used to like a pumpkin pumpkin roll. This would be a butterkin pumpkin roll or mm -hmm. yeah, just something different. Mm -hmm. And we've been really impressed with, so squash is bread and every year this is a newer variety that has come out that is very productive. It's very pest resistant. So um, they've been able to make these plants less desirable to the pest. So they're, they're able to produce more fruit that is less modeled, so they keep really well, they yield a lot, they're vigorous plants. It's a really impressive variety, and it's, um, it's kind of a testament to, you know, these people are really passionate about plant breeding, that they're able to create such strong varieties. Um, so we, that's why we really like the, the butterkin. Yeah. Okay. Is the skin edible on the butter tin? Nothing would be technically inedible. It's just whether it would be palatable to you. <laughs> no, <laughs> skin is not edible. You I mean, could, <laughs> you could technically digest it. You I have don't, to like. I don't think it would like cut you internally. It's just a little um, firm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's one thing to look for in squash too. When you're buying a squash, the the squash where you can eat the skin, like the delicata, the Japanese pumpkins, they're not going to keep as long as something like a butterkin or a butternut. Butterkin and butternut, they have really thick skin. They're going to last really, really long time, months. Yeah. Um. So something to keep in mind when you're buying squash. I've actually, I. <laughs> I eat the butternut squash skin, so I don't know if like yeah. Certain, certain varieties, I think you definitely can, and uh, it depends on how you prepare it. Yeah, that too. Okay. <laughs> you can eat really tough parts of meat if you like. Yeah. You know, prepare it properly. Yeah. Yeah, and they say that a lot of the nutrients and everything is in the skin, so it it's beneficial for you to to eat it. I'm I'm gonna use Cassandra's point to folks when they ask me if they can eat something. I was be like, yes, it's all edible. It's all digestible. It's great. <laughs> yes. Very fibrous, yeah. I love that. <laughs> all right. Um, we had a question come in from Tracy. Any flavor di difference to you between red and green kabocha? I have not noticed a difference in the flavor. Um, it's really kind of just a, I mean, so much, so within the squash family, there's so much diversity and you can actually, not all squash came from the same, like one type of plant. It's actually a really diverse family. And there's so much genetic variation that you can get different flavors. Like two things that are actually different species can taste more similar than two that are the same. Um, but so I, I don't know if they're, see, we grow about 40 different varieties and we still like barely tap into the squash groups, all, all potential squash varieties. We haven't, I think we attempted to grow a red kabocha, but it was more pest, um, you know, susceptible. So we didn't get as good of yield, but even the ones that we tried, I hadn't noticed the difference. Um, I think sometimes the brighter colored fruit too are more susceptible to the, the pests, but, um, I haven't noticed, and it's, I, I find it almost hard to even notice the subtle differences in some of the winter squash anyway. It's more like size, different sizes, kind of more, how we classify it for use rather than maybe the subtleties in flavor. Yeah. Okay. All right, I have, we've got a couple other questions too. I'm gonna save those and trickle them in as we go. Um, 
before we get into our next section of this, I wanted to share a squash joke with you all. Um, let's see, what kind of vegetable do you get when an elephant walks through your garden? I don't know, what do you get? Squash. Oh my gosh. Squash. <laughs> Our daughter would like that one. <laughs> All right, so we are going to do a little guessing game. Um, it's not intended to be super hard, and if you don't know an answer, just click one. It's not a big deal. I just want, I thought it'd be fun to engage everyone, and then we'll get the, the discussion going on each variety of squash. So we're not going to shame people like we talked about earlier? Probably <laughs> shame you. <laughs> no. Okay, all right, we'll stay for the next one. Or have a worst loser or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Least knowledgeable squash. Yeah. All right, so. Our first variety here. So here it is. Started with a really easy one. And then. And then you can guess now what variety you think it is. Yeah, this was too easy. <laughs> Very popular one with the countryside crowd. Oh, yeah. I love using pictures of this one because it just looks so pretty. Oh, yeah. So, as you can see, I think maybe some people picked that. Maybe it was Jimmy and Cassandra as a joke. They picked that third <laughs> one, but... Uh... <laughs> I don't joke around when it comes to Splash Christina. <laughs> All right, so the delicata, um, that is also known as a peanut squash, bohemian squash, or a sweet potato squash. I actually didn't know any of that until I looked it up on Google, but good to know. It's got a delicate squint skin that's edible. I think we said that a little earlier. Um, yeah. Do either of you guys have anything, like what, what do you like to cook with it, Kathleen, or Jimmy and Cassandra? We like to just saute it. Jimmy is actually, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy cooks maybe two thirds of the time, so he, he maybe can explain his. I like it on a pizza, <laughs> like yeah, a squash pizza. Really so like squash onions and just like a little bit of honey drizzle is really good. Kind of indulgent, but very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, or just side. Saute, yeah, mostly sauteed. We like to saute things because it's faster. Yeah. Um, so just cut in half and then cut into half crescents and um, just sauteed with some garlic and oil. Or uh, delicata is really good grilled too. You do like those, you do slices like that and put it on the grill. Once again, with like honey or something. Very mm -hmm. good. I, my favorite way to do it is to slice it just like you said in half and then sliced and doing it with onions, sauteing it with onions, just like the flavor with the like caramelized kind of onion and the squash is just so good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I recommend trying that out. Okay. Um, so let's go on to our next one. I think this is maybe a little harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so get a good look at that, and then here we go. I tricked a few people with some of the, the options there. Okay. I think still a couple coming in. Okay, so most people got it right. It's a blue Hubbard. Um, so the blue Hubbard, um, <clears throat> what do I know about that? The proper name for it is a New England blue Hubbard. Um, and that's because it, it originated in New England. Um, it's got a deep orange flesh 
and a nutty, very sweet flavor similar to a sweet potato. And these get very big. These are 11 to 20 pounds in size. Um, Jimmy and Cassandra, have you ever tried growing this variety? Is it hard to grow? Yes, incredibly. Yeah. Well, it's very, <laughs> uh, it's very pest susceptible. They, they just really like, um, like that, that variety. Um, so squash has been around, especially the Hubbard varieties for thousands of years. The Native Americans grew squash. Um, it was of the may have heard of the three sisters method with corn and beans and squash they would grow them all together the corn would provide structure for the beans to climb and then the squash would grow in the understory to suppress weeds um, the beans would fix nitrogen which helped the corn and um, i think even they worked kind of synergistically to um, ward off pests too so you even um, said that it was native to New England. It was native to um, Native American tribes in New England. Um, so it's one of the older type varieties. Um, so squash has been, you know, in commercial vegetable production, um, things have been um, uh, bred. More, more recent varieties have been bred, but that one is actually more of a, like a native variety, um, which kind of, I think is part of the reason it's very susceptible to pests. And it can, we have grown it. So the other thing about Hubbard is um, all squash kind of have a, plants have a potential to produce a certain poundage of fruit. So like a delicata plant, you'll get a leaf, a leaf, a fruit, a leaf, a leaf, a fruit, and you might get 10 delicata from one plant. But Hubbard naturally put out fewer flowers and they will yield fewer fruit and they will be massive. So it's more of a gamble in some ways as a producer because you if you get a damaged hubbard well that's your whole crop if you only get one fruit per plant versus something like delicata where if you have 10 plants you have 100 fruit so you have less it's less of a risk um for damage and a, you know a small blemish on a large fruit can damage the whole a large plant a large squash will damage the whole one so we have grown it in the past um we'll use it as a trap crop actually <laughs> so we'll plant it in the perimeter of the squash area and so then as the insects come in, they'll target that. And so then we'll pretty much lose that entire crop, but the more internal crops will be um, more protected. Yeah, it's, a, it's our sacrifice crop. It's, yeah. it's really hard to grow. If you find it, buy it. It's really good squash. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of disappointed here because I want to try it. I don't like that you don't use it as a... Um, some people are very good. Other farmers are very, very good at growing it. We just haven't yeah. had a lot of luck. Well, like I said, we grow, we've attempted this calendar year, we might have grown about, thir started attempting 30 varieties. And then you'll have, you'll lose some. We did start with Hubbard and we actually selected a smaller variety of Hubbard, but I think we might have only yielded like 10 squash for the whole season. So that's part of it is we'll, yeah. we won't get a lot and they'll, you know, they won't, they won't sustain a market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Kathleen, have you ever cooked with it? I'm very interested to hear if there's like any cool dishes you can make with such a, it's just so pretty, I think. Oh, I can't hear her. Oh no. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I grew up in New England, and so Blue Hubbard was a big deal in our house. And they, when my mother would get them, they were enormous. And it was funny, you know, we talk about one of the most difficult things that our customers and, and your customers probably do too is um, peeling and getting the skin off the squash. My mother used to make Blue Hubbard pie for Thanksgiving instead of pumpkin pies. And my dad would bring a hatchet or an ax or something major and he that was his job was to just peel the Hubbard squash for my mother or otherwise we weren't getting a pie because she wasn't gonna deal with it. So I don't know how invested people would be because they have issues just working with some of the other squashes and getting the skins off. Um, but the flesh inside is amazing and 
My, I've never, I only cooked with it with my mother. I've never done anything here um, because I haven't found anybody that actually grows it. Yeah. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, I never see it either. I think that maybe I saw it at like Whole Foods, but, and maybe the farmer's market last year, but it's a rare find for sure. Okay, so next variety. This is also a sort of easy one, but I made the, the answers a little bit tricky because there's two varieties that look very similar. A lot of people fell for my trap. <laughs> so, okay, still coming in. All right. Oh. So, the majority of people thought it was the carnival squash, but this is actually a sweet dumpling. <laughs> um, the difference between the two, the coloring um, of a sweet dumpling is green, um, just green stripes, whereas the um, carnival has orange and uh, orange, green, yellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, am I, I'm right in saying that, right? I'm like, I hope I got that right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and these ones are pretty small, about a baseball size. Um, they have a bright orange flesh, similar to the color of a sweet potato. Um, and they have a very sweet flavor with a little bit of a hazelnut-like flavor as well. Yeah. That one you're holding, Jimmy, is, is that a, like, cause doesn't it have a little orange? I have a hard time telling them apart. Yeah, that's not a sweet dumpling. Okay. This, that's this a, a heart of gold or carnival. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one is a cross between a sweet dumpling and an acorn. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna. I have. We're gonna skip that one because I have that in the oh. pool as well. But now I don't even know the answer. No. I. I should have thought of that. Of course, we're gonna talk about it. Um. But yeah, that that one. Yeah, is a cross between a sweet dumpling and acorn. And it's a little bit bigger than the sweet dumpling, right? Yeah, the sweet dumpling, yeah, they're like very small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're um, very sweet, very sweet. I'd say they're one of the sweetest squash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I know, I really like, so Kathleen prepared a stuffed carnival squash. I know like that's my favorite way to prepare those small short ones is to exactly. stuff them. Um, I think that that just offers a lot of different creative ideas. You can put whatever you want inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of that for our meals to go. So people love black beans and hummus and, you know, all sorts of almost like a chili um, Southwestern kind of theme that you can put in them and have a lot of fun with them with sauces and so, and then, then they eat the squash <laughs> when they're not, that might not be something that they're used to having. Um, so it encourages, especially their kids to try them because they're more fun to eat that way. Mm -hmm. That made me think of bringing up another joke. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll just, uh, change the topic real quick. What is the difference between squash and snot? I don't know what. <laughs> Children will eat their snot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like when she said, you know, some people may not eat the squash. I thought, yeah, kids don't really like very much. Perfect joke. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next one then. This one. I think is it's a fairly easy one. Let's see if everyone agrees with that. 
My mom is laughing in the background. I don't think she thinks it's an easy one. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Well, majority got it right, so that's good. But I guess I was I, I was a little sneaky with these um, answers because I snuck in other like legit varieties into the name, but that's not actually the name of a variety. Okay, we are a few more people maybe that will respond. Maybe not. Okay, so. This one is the red curry. My mom got it wrong. She's not happy with it. So <laughs> don't take this too seriously, guys. It's, it's okay. <laughs> All right. So the red curry, um, that one <clears throat> is a smaller and more manageable version of the Hubbard squash. Um, and obviously a different color. But does it also is that does it come in other colors i mean obviously red curry is just red curry but is there like green curry or all i've all we've ever grown was a red curry i'm not okay. um it could be out there it's not as popular red curry is by far the most popular of that type yeah. um, probably comes in another color we just don't grow it well it would be blue if it came in another color that's true mm -hmm. um does is the flavor the same as a blue hubbard i find it to be very similar yeah kind of nutty and like yeah more savory mm -hmm. yeah, yeah like a yeah almost like a pumpkin i both of those i always relate yeah. them to like a pumpkin or i think a pie well not yeah not like as kind of like pumpkiny as a pumpkin yeah but yeah exactly yeah it's not as it's got more a complex flavor than like a butternut it's really good i mean it's a nice mellow flavor yeah, I tried it a few weeks ago, and I thought, like, it, I think it's my favorite squash I've ever tasted. Like, it was more substantial than, like, a butternut. It had just a different texture that wasn't stringy, but it was, like, dense and, like, sweet. Mm -hmm. It was good. Really yeah, It's probably it. most similar to a sweet potato. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like, starchier or, or just, uh, it was nutty. It's nutty, too. Nutty and creamy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of my favorites too, Christina. Mm -hmm. I, it's yeah. I, we make um, I'll make porridge out of it. So cream it up, and you can put a little bit of rice and ginger and coconut milk in it, and that's delicious. Um, I'm gonna make gnocchi with it for Thanksgiving. Um, it makes a really nice base for those potato dumplings. Um, it's so versatile, but yeah, it's probably one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Pauline, when you're like preparing the squash for, to like use an enoki or something, how do you how do you do that? What's your process? I always roast because roasting provides so much flavor. Um, even before we make a soup, usually I will roast the butternut squash or roast the sweet potato just because you get that caramelization in the oven and that adds great flavor. So, and not to mention the fact it's so easy to just slice it in half. I don't even have to take the seeds out if I don't want to and just roast it up and then scoop the flesh out. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, before we get to the next variety, let's do another joke. Um, what does the linguine say to the spaghetti squash? I don't know what. Impasta. <laughs> okay. Well, I saw there was a question on how you store squash. Mm -hmm. um, the best temperature is 50 degrees in a root cellar. I think she was going to get to that. Yeah, oh. it's, it's okay. We can do it now. I was oh. going to them for the end if it wasn't okay. directly related to a specific variety. Oh, but yeah, yeah. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, you, we can say it twice. It's, yeah, you can just go ahead and continue talking about it. That's fine. Um, it's just like a medium, like a room temperature relative humidity. It doesn't need a lot of humidity or it will rot. Some people store it on top of something that wicks moisture away, like newspaper or like straw, but that's a little kind of biologically active, maybe not. That was, that's more of like an older technique. If you got some straw laying around, throw your squash on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just root cellar like conditions, but not in the fridge. That's a little too cold. Fridge is usually like under 40 degrees, you know, like high 30s. Mm -hmm which is a little, and more higher humidity too. So that's a little too much humidity for squash. So it's better like your garage or, or basement. Okay. And they'll last, I mean, some, if they're blemish free, they'll last nine months, a lot of varieties. It's when they start to have blemishes on them that the blemishes, you know, will start to grow from a spot and, and then it'll, the bacteria will get in and it will expand. So if you start to notice, you know, you just check it every so often. And if you notice a blemish, then start to use them. Cool. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next squash. Here we go. This looks like the butterkin, but it's bigger than the butterkin. So I should have put that in there as a, <laughs> an answer. Okay. So this one's the cheese pumpkin, which most people got right. But pie pumpkin is also, I would have fallen for that if I didn't know. Um, okay. So this one gets its name because it looks like a cheese wheel. Um, <clears throat> and this is actually the most popular one for making pumpkin pies. Um, I guess it used to be, it was used a lot um, many years ago, and then it kind of started disappearing. And there's a lot of cool stories, like Edible has an article about it online of like the story of bringing it back and seed saving so that it didn't um, just disappear. Because this is a very sweet one that, like I said, is great for pies. Um, and it's about six to 10 pounds in size. And the proper term, for, like the very proper name for it is Long Island Cheese Pumpkin because that's where it originated from. Um, is this one? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, the, I think this is a perfect, perfect example of what's really interesting about the squash family because it looks so much like the butterkin, but they're actually so distinctively unique. It's kind of like when you... Um, Throughout dog breeding, sometimes you started with a huge, you know, large poodle, and now it looks more like a tiny, uh, you can cross it with different breeds, and it winds up looking more like a, a Shih Tzu than a large poodle. It's kind of similar to squash that there's so much genetic variation that you can wind up with two squash that look the same, but they're actually, they couldn't even breed with each other. They're that, um, they're that unique. So that's what, I think that's really cool about food, and we try to classify everything, and all these categories. Oh, this is a butternut. This is a, uh, you know, this and that. But the lines are much blurrier, which I think is what's fun about food and plants. And it's uh, this is a good example of that. Yeah, and I just want to encourage everybody this Thanksgiving to to cook pies out of real squash. Like take an actual squash and cook a pie out of it. It's so much better than than canned squash. And uh, everybody will think you're an amazing cook. And it's really it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we I mean, I had a, uh, I have a customer of mine that comes in that is a true loan engineer and mm -hmm. we do a small CSA here at the store and I gave them a little pumpkin pie for one of their uh, boxes and he's, you know, and immediately I'm like, it's not a jack-o'-lantern. Don't go home and put eyeballs <laughs> in it. And, 
He's like, well, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, well, you're an engineer. You can figure it out. You know, I chose, told him how to roast it. And he came in because they've been getting pumpkin pie, um, pumpkin spice lattes here. And we roast the pumpkin, we puree it, you know, and we use that in the, in the bar with spices as opposed to those sugary syrups. And uh, he was so proud of himself. He came in, he's like, I made the pie, I made the puree, I made my own pumpkin spice latte. Um, so it was really cute that he, I mean, it was a project for him, but um, you know, even his wife came in and said that the pie was delicious. So it always, I always get excited when people, you know, embrace and try new things when it comes to food. Yeah, me too. It, it is exciting. It's it's good sense of accomplishment. It's better for your health. It's better for mm -hmm. the environment because you're most likely buying the squash from mm -hmm. a local producer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a life skill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> definitely like squash. I can imagine. I've, I've always like cooked squash through my life. My mom raised me to just be in the kitchen and cook with all those things, but I can good. definitely see how a squash would be intimidating and that, like doing something like this, teaching people what to do is just so helpful. So I really hope you guys find this to be um, really expanding your like knowledge on squash so that you're more comfortable in the kitchen. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one. But first, we'll do another joke. <laughs> um, what did the squash farmer say to the produce thief at the farmer's market? I don't know. You butter not steal my squash. <laughs> <laughs> you butter not. That's funny. Okay. And I do see the questions that are coming in, so we will get to those. We're going to do a couple more squash, and then we'll answer those. All right, next one. So we're going to skip. There's the carnival, but you guys would have probably already got that right. So we'll skip that one and go here. Oh, this was too easy. Mm. Okay. So majority got it right. This is the turban squash. And so this one is named turban squash for its turban-like cap on the blossom end of the squash. Um, a lot of people use this for decoration more than cooking, but you, you should use it for cooking because it's a great squash. It tastes great, but I know that I don't often see it out and about, like I don't see it at the grocery store. I don't really see it at the farmer's market, although I did last year. So I'm guessing this is similar to the Hubbard and that it's kind of hard to grow. Is that right? Yeah, it's just really, all those ones that have the softer rind are the um, young insects climb the onto the fruit and will suck it, and it models the skin, so it's just more susceptible. Like, the butterkin has a very hard rind. Pumpkins can have a hard rind. Butternut has a hard rind. So the ones with the softer, it just are more, uh, it's just easier for them to pierce the skin. Yeah. But we have grown that actually. Yeah, we do like it. Yeah. For sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's really cool. I mean, it's like huge and gnarly looking. Yeah, I guess they get to be about five pounds. So not as big as the Hubbard, but that's still a big squash. Yeah, definitely. That'll mm -hmm. feed a family for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, is the flavor of this one, like, is it really sweet or not so much? What is it like? It's not that sweet. It's more like the Hubbard or the Red Curry. Are, those ones are sweet though, right? They're, they're not as sweet as a butternut. Okay. I feel butternut is on the higher end of the sweetness spectrum, I would say. And then those are more, they're sweet. I would almost say the um, Kaboka is maybe on the other end 
of least sweet. Um, acorn, I don't find to be very sweet either, but um, I would put it maybe in the middle. Okay. It's not overly sweet, but it's not, it um, doesn't have more like bitters in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathleen, I know that, so like these squashes, do you ever prepare anything with them at your cafe? So like, yeah, like a turban squash or is it hard to source them? And you can't really do that. I haven't been able to find them anywhere. And I, and something that's that sort of gnarly and big and is not as easy for us to work with. And since we're cutting and preparing everything from scratch, we tend to work with things that are a little bit easier to, you know, to get through. If we're making, you know, 40 or 50 dinners for some, for a group, um, it's easy to work with delicata or curry or something where you don't have to peel the skins before you're cooking them as opposed to butternut. And do you know, Cassandra, the, what the chemical, I don't know what the term would be, but there's a texture on the inside of the butternut squash that creates this sort of funny feeling on your hands when you, when you peel them. And my staff after like, cutting 20 or 30 of them, it takes a couple days for it to go away. What like, is, like the, it's like mucilaginous kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, and it makes there, I mean, it's, you get a little bit of the orange natural, you know, phytonutrient color on your hand, but it's a, it's an interesting texture that it puts on your skin after you've cut most, you know, multiple squashes. I, you know, I, I mean, I only think of it because now that you're saying that, um, we don't probably, we don't cut as many squash as you do. So, <laughs> so we haven't noticed like that compounding effect, but, um, no, I, yeah, I don't know what, it's just like an oxidative reaction. I don't know. How. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. I've yeah. definitely experienced that too. Every time I cut a butternut squash and it like stays on there for a few hours, no amount of hand washing makes it go away. Um, but we actually, I can't tell you any specifics about what it is either, but um, our farmer's market manager actually did a blog post on it last year. So you can read her blog post. It was okay. like a year ago, but it's on our website. Um, but yeah, she, she talks about it. Cause well, I cool. just tell the kids that it's, um, that they're getting their nutrients through their skin, you know, so to add an extra benefit of uh -huh. cutting vegetables. Uh -huh. Yeah, you should charge them, charge them for that. Charge them extra, yeah, take away from their pay. <laughs> um, treatment. One, one thing I want to say about the turban squash, getting back to your point of uh, ease of preparation, this is one that I would roast whole rather than trying to skin it because it's so like weird shaped that you're going to have an impossible time skinning it. And then uh, like just stuffing it and roasting it, um, a good thing that people don't think about is if you cut a flat spot on the squash, it's going to have the squash sit flatter, it not at an angle, so your stuffing won't, uh, like, pour out in the oven. Just a little tip. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Make, like, a flat surface. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Let's, let's get into our last variety here. I threw some tomato variety names into some of these polls and you guys are falling for them. They do sound legit, but <laughs> that is not a squash variety. Most people got this one right. So this is the honey nut. All right. So this one actually has a cool story because it's one of the newest varieties of squash. Um, a chef kind of challenged a breeder at Cornell University to um, shrink down the butternut squash and make the flavor more intense and the nutrients more give it more nutrients, just basically shrink the whole thing down and have it have all of it into a smaller compact 
um, squash. And what was interesting about that is this, this breeder had actually, before being asked to do this, he had been testing smaller squashes um, and was having a hard time selling it to seed companies because um, that a small squash like that doesn't really fit most people's concept of a squash. Um, and so it's just not as desirable. So it was a hard sell. But this particular squash was bred specifically for flavor. And the chef took it to a chef conference and showed it to um, nine of the most popular chefs in the world. And then some of them like ran with it. And that's how um, this breeder believes it actually took off and the, the seed companies began you know, selling the seeds. Um, so this is, I, I've actually never tried it myself. If you've tried it, I've heard many great things about it. Um, so I'll let, I'll let Jimmy and Cassandra speak to maybe the taste of it. Um, I just remember it being very sweet. Yeah, say all, all the things you just said. It's like a butternut on steroids, right? It's, yeah. like, a, it's like a very like sweet, flavorful uh, butternut squash. They're super cute. Um, <laughs> you can serve them just like individually, like individual squash halves. Yeah. Um, well, and it's interesting because it, um, I mean, so like as it, as the fruit's growing, it, um, like when you cut it, the sap is just so sweet. Like it, it just has, it's just very sweet. Like everything about it is sweet. When you cut it, like the top, it's almost like the sa sweet sap pours yeah, out. Yeah, like sap pours out of the stem when you cut it. That's, that's yeah. a testament to how sweet it is. Yeah. Um, someone asked, well, they said in the chat, they just ate a honey nut squash while watching this and theirs did not look like that one. I'm wondering if maybe, like those had some green on them, if maybe that's um, what you're referring to, because I know that green means it's not ripe yet. So that picture I showed, those technically weren't ripe yet, were they? No, they have a little green on them when they're, um, yeah. when they're still ripening, yeah. And oh. some of them have a little bit of like genetic off type about them that they keep a little bit of green in there yeah so if you're not sure if it's ready or not you can take your uh, fingernail and just scrape the skin of the squash if anything comes off under your your uh, fingernail um, it's not quite ready yet you got to be careful you don't want to like scrape a huge hole in it just a little tiny pest plot but and a lot of squash if it's not the um so the coloring comes from like the sun exposure and enrich it the like the beta carotenes continue to develop on the skin. So it might have just been shaded if it's green for some squash. Some you need to, you cure them by putting them in the sun and it further develops their color, but they would have been ready to eat before that. It just enriches the color and like dries the skin more, but they were still ready to eat. They're ready to eat whenever the seeds inside are mature. Like if you cut it open, it looks like you could have planted that seed, then it was ready, ready. And you can eat squash at all stages of readiness. So you got your summer squashes, which are immature, and then over the course of like a month to two months, they'll mature. In that whole time, you could have eaten eaten it at any point. It's just its flavor is richer the, the more mature it is. Okay. Hmm. Cool. All right. Let's start answering some of these questions here because we've got about four minutes till noon. So. Um, I'll just read this one from Colleen. So for those of us cooking at home, can you pretty much use any of these varieties interchangeably or is it really important to only use certain varieties in certain recipes? I think that <clears throat> some of them are, um, or most all of them are good for soups, for roasting, but if you wanted to cut them to put them in a salad or you wanted them to hold their structure, then you might be more specific about which squash that you're choosing. I think the butternut is probably the most versatile. Um, I, but there are some that are so creamy. And when once you cook them, they're very hard. Like you wouldn't want to cut them, try to cut them and put them in a salad because they would fall apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this question from Laura, have you ever grown or tasted coconut squash? How do you prepare it if you have? I've never heard of that variety. I've never heard of that. I, yeah, I'd have to look, look that up. Yeah, the answer is no, but we will <laughs> Google it as soon as we get off of this call. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, I guess she got it from Trader Joe's. So yeah, it must be. Okay. Um, I've grown butternut squash at home for years and always develop fungus that starts at the root and works its way out the plant vines and kills off fruit. Is it result of insects? Same happens with pumpkins. How do you prevent this? It's probably not yours. Um, yeah, I mean, the most common problems with squash it are primarily insect related, but if they are sitting in a lot of water, there can be like, you know, soil pathogens that can kill them. Uh, the most common insects though, if you put, it's best to, you'll have most success if you grow squash from transplants. So you grow them in like a container and then tr transplant them into your garden and you keep them covered until they start to flower. So you could cover them with like a row cover material something that's breathable, like an agricultural material to keep those beetle insects out. And then hopefully by the time they start flowering, they're large enough that they can, can sustain the pest damage. But so that um, there's a vine borer that oftentimes, but it doesn't sound, I mean, it actually doesn't sound like what um, she's, they're describing because the vine borer typically just kills it and it just wilts. Um, it causes bacterial wilt, but a fungus that starts, a fungus would sound more soil born and it would have a more opportunity to grow if it's maybe over watered or maybe you need to rotate the location of the crop. You can't grow them. Most things need to be rotated. You can't grow them in the same location. Uh, you need to rotate them at least three years apart. Yeah, that's a big one. Make sure you're not planting squash in the same spot every single time. The most common problems are like powdery mildew, vine borers, and cucumber beetles. All three of those things, we're just going to tell you to outcompete. We're not a, we don't spray anything on our farm. So we just, like she said, try to grow the squash big enough to where it's just going to keep growing. If it gets powdery mildew, it's just going to grow out of it. That's more of a late season thing too. When the Yeah. Yeah. You'll get that at the end. Um, vine borers are a pain. We've lost <laughs> entire crops to them. Um, so, so the larvae live in the soil. So if you grew a squash or something similar to a squash in the same location the year before, they probably the larvae are living in the soil and they'll just come up from the bottom and attack the plant that way. For the home gardener though, with the vine borers, you can actually cut it out of the stem. And what you would do is actually cut the stem and then try to wrap something around it so it heals itself. We're not gonna do that because we grow fields of squash and it would be insane, but um, that's a good way to get rid of vine borers. Um, okay, just side note, the, it's actually a shirt that's tied on the dog's leg because she split her leg open. Um, it's, yeah, so she has a wound on her leg that she got. Um, it's a long story. Yeah. Um, she's fine. Um, the squash pests are mostly in the beetle family, or there's also smaller insects called aphids. Um, but squash can grow well in containers. It just requires a lot of watering. Um, so if you aren't able to, you know, rotate your garden plot, you could just grow them in new potting, a new pot with new mix, uh, in order to avoid some of those problems. And then, so the pests are mostly beetles, which, um, you just have to cover them. And then by the time, cover them until they start flowering, which is about a month. So from the time you maybe buy them, if you buy them at a garden center, you're going to want to, I mean, just make sure you don't see any beetles on them, but then, um, you know, maybe rinse them off even and then keep them covered for like a month as they grow and then you can uncover them hopefully they're big enough that they will be able to outcompete the pest all right we're gonna do just one more question um what's best to do with buttercup squash i grew them this year and not sure what to do with them buttercup oh yeah those are really good kathleen you wanna yeah well, I was going to say, I had them for the first time this year, and we probably cooked, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 at a time, and I was eating probably four of them a day, <laughs> um, just roasting them. Uh, we would put sometimes maple syrup and harissa on top of them, and then I just picked them up whole and ate them like I would eat a sandwich. They're so delicious, um, you know, cut in half. Um, you can scoop the flesh out, but because the skin is edible, 
they're just so tasty and so sweet. Uh, I don't know that I would use them. You'd have to cook a lot of them to make soup out of them unless it was just for a few people, but they're just really delicious as a side dish. Um, something that I want to add that you guys, since you've been talking about not spraying and the nutrition nerd and me comes out and I don't think people understand that when you let the plant fight its own system, ecosystem around it, that what it does is it builds up the phytonutrients in the plant and makes the plant so much healthier. And then all those antioxidants are what we're getting out of the food. Um, and so even if uh, farmers aren't practicing or, or licensed or read whatever certified organic, if they're following organic practices um, and responsible farming, we get so many benef health benefits from all of that. So I really appreciate that you guys, because I know how hard you work and how hard it is to fight with all of that and let nature do its thing, but it's the best thing for the plan and the best thing for us from a food source. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're a little over on time now, so we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank everyone so much for joining us and a special thank you to our guests and to those that donated a little bit of money today. Um, that goes to support the work we do at Countryside and it's going to support um, those that shared their expertise with us today, our special guests. Um, <clears throat> I hope that you guys have learned a little bit about squash today and also maybe harvest a little deeper understanding um, <clears throat> for um, supporting local and um, just going to the farmer's market and supporting those local farmers. Um, they do work so hard. Jimmy and Cassandra, all of the farmers that sell at our market are amazing. <clears throat> um, I don't know about you, but the, this time of year actually makes me really miss the harvest season. Like things are winding down. Um, but fortunately there's still farmers that sell at our winter curbside market. Um, and they bring fresh produce. Um, it doesn't, it, it helps me get through the winter, but you know, I'm still like counting down those days until I see asparagus. Cause I feel like that's when it all starts coming in is when the asparagus starts. Um, I also want to say, so we had our virtual tomato tasting back in July. Uh, maybe some of you joined us, maybe not. That was a good time. But so this event, um, that, well, that event kicked off our um, harvest season campaign. And this event is kind of wrapping it up. Um, but we still want to meet our fundraising goal. So starting today, anyone that donates <clears throat> At the $20 level, a reoccurring monthly gift will be on the VIP list to receive a harvest calendar for the 2021 season that um, showcases all of the produce that are in season from month to month. And it will also have 12 different local seasonal recipes. Um, so those are also going to go on sale to the public a little later on but we only have a limited quantity. So if you want one, um, we'd really appreciate the donation. You'll get that free calendar and a huge thank you from us. Um, so to become a supporting member, you can go to countrysidefoodandfarms.org and click the make a gift button. All right, that is all I got. Do you guys have anything else to say? I would just say, yeah, I mean, squash is as American as apple pie. So just eat, eat lots of squash. It's part of, I think it's part of like our, our native cuisine so you should try and incorporate it you know mm -hmm. incorporate it with different uh flavors from other cultures that you've absorbed through your experiences and you know make some really good meals out of it yeah. um i want to say real quick we miss you too heidi one <laughs> of our vendors that moved away just come she's she's in this meeting right now and we miss her already so we miss you too heidi <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a great Sunday and a happy Thanksgiving. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Bye. Bye.